Chapter 36, A Window of Good and Evil Dinner that night was enjoyed outside the caring center on the stone patio. Lily, San, and Lima brought extra food and stayed to enjoy it with those in the mansion. Lima had kindly pushed up a carry cart of fruit scraps and leftover bread to the girl's yard, knowing that Amy would be delighted to feed it to the animals. Everyone had a blanket around their shoulders as the breeze whipped their hair around. Kenzie had been visiting the farmers, and he returned with a wide, cream-colored scarf in his hands. Look at this, everyone, he said proudly. Vanitha has made this from the sheep wool. She has been making all kinds of beautiful things. Feel how warm this is. Taking it around to everyone, they all tried it on with pleasure. Vanitha is so clever, the curly-haired nurse exclaimed. She's even going to try coloring some of the wool with raspberry juice. I'll trade for one, Amy smiled, wrapping herself in the cozy scarf. The large blankets they had been using were rather cumbersome. Me too, Santa piped up. I'd like a colored one. Kenzie was pleased. When he sat down to eat his meal, Santa and Lima told him of things that had been happening in the gardens. They were picking apples every day. A bat had landed in Santa's hair one night, and Lima demonstrated her wild reaction, which everyone thought was funny. Did you hear about Damien and Georgia? Lily asked. Hush, Ponzi said quietly, his eyes darting over to Zaheer. Not now. Before anyone could ask questions, he begged Lily to tell them about the new construction in the fun forest. The bows and arrows were of great interest. Some felt they were dangerous. Others thought it sounded fun. As they discussed the daily happening, Santa told them she was keeping an eye on the mango tree and hoping the fruit would be ready in a week. She was also elated that rainbows could be seen down in the gardens late in the afternoon. While Uncle Louis rocked comfortably back and forth on the bench swing, the others laughed and joked about the stone table. When she had finished eating, Amy got up to feed the animals. Sahir joined her. The squirrels and birds were already helping themselves to the scraps in the cart. The dark-haired man with one bright blue eye tried to whistle to the squirrels. Due to the tightness on the right side of his face, it took several attempts before he managed to make the familiar noise. However, it had been a long time since the squirrels had heard the sound. They perked up and chattered at him, but they didn't come running. The deer, eager for treats, saw the apple cores and waltzed over. Gradually, the sun fell below the horizon and twilight set in. Ponzi asked if he could go back to his home for the night, and Uncle Louis agreed that he was well enough. So he and Lily meandered off happily, hand in hand, to the stairs. Santa and Lima took the path to the beach. Once the cart of scraps was empty, Zaheer walked over to sit down again with Uncle Louis on the bench swing. The dark-haired patient didn't seem to feel the same urgency to return to his house. Panting hard, Vahid came running from the clearing in distress. Kenzie, he wheezed, can you come to the farm for a bit and help us out? Looking up from the stone table where he had been sitting, Kenzie said, sure, what's the matter? It's Vanitha, his friend blurted out. She... She found out, with an anxious glance in Zaheer's direction, he ran over and whispered something in Kenzie's ear. A pained look came over Kenzie's face. She's just really upset, Fahid explained to everyone else. She's just really upset, Fahid explained to everyone else. Kenzie always knows what to say to people. Can you please come with me for a while? Let's take tonight off from reading, Uncle Louis suggested. Feel free to go, Kenzie. I think we can all manage tonight. With a grateful nod, the two farmers dashed off together. Sitting down beside Uncle Louie on the sturdy bench swing he had crafted months ago, Sahir talked to the older Tani about some of the things they had read. Both were of the opinion that so far, the Bible was more convincing than the professor's complicated treaties against it. While she patted the deer, Amy enjoyed listening. As the loons cried out to each other down in the lake, paradise gradually became a peaceful place. The darkness descended. The breeze blew gently. The pets were called home, and many tinies went to bed. Sahir left to visit the outhouse. Uncle Louie watched Amy trying to coax a squirrel to take a leftover strawberry top from her hand. Having already gorged itself and no longer used to receiving nightly handouts, the squirrel was hesitant to come any closer. The older man desperately wanted to get to the cave. He could feel that his days were numbered, and he didn't have much time left. His heart had been beating in an erratic fashion the last few nights, although he hadn't told anyone. Yet he knew there was no way to get down and back from the cave without someone on either side. 
Well, he felt that both Kenzie and Zaheer would be of great assistance to help his sister lead Paradise, the last instruction from the professor had indicated she was to choose one. Having been confined to the caring center for almost three weeks, he had been unable to discuss anything further with his father. Fairly confident that he understood Zaheer's feelings after a recent talk, Uncle Louis wasn't absolutely certain he knew Amy's. He had observed that she and Kenzie worked very well together and had formed a close friendship, but he also suspected she cared deeply for Zaheer. From his bed by the window, the older man had noticed the incredible dedication, some very loving looks, and the quickness to shield one patient in particular from pain of any kind. Yet he did wonder if the reactions he had witnessed were motivated by Amy's compassionate heart or true love. Well, he was hesitant to push a relationship together that was still fragile and fraught with misunderstandings, Uncle Louie was longing to get to the cave and have one full night of investigation. He needed to be certain that the Bible was true. Feeling a few more irregular beats in his chest, he wondered if this might be his last opportunity. Amy looked up from feeding the squirrel and asked, Are you doing okay? Do you need a drink? Uncle Louie motioned for her to join him on the swinging bench. When she was seated beside him, he asked quietly, Do you think you could take me to the control cave tonight? Mm, I can try, she said hesitantly. Helping Uncle Louie get down the hill wouldn't be so difficult, but she had no idea how she would get him back up. I'd really like to do some research on the internet about the Bible, and I'd like to do it with you, he said, trembling a little from the cooling temperature, even with a blanket wrapped all around him. I feel this is something that we need to sort out together, he pleaded, and I'm not sure how much time I have left. If it takes us half the night to get there, I'll do my best, she promised. Taking off the new woolen scarf that Vanitha had made, she wrapped it around his shoulders. This is so warm, she smiled. Amy, the older tiny said hesitantly, if something happens to me, which it will soon, I feel that leaving paradise may be too big a burden for you to carry alone. Is, is that how you feel? Yes, she sighed, leaning close and wrapping her hands tightly around his arm. That's why you must hold on, Uncle Louie. I need you. If you could choose another tiny to share this responsibility with, he said thoughtfully, someone to help you make the important decisions, who would you choose? Amy sighed and looked away, but she didn't hesitate long. Say here, she admitted. A huge smile spread across Uncle Louie's face. I thought as much, he replied, but I didn't want to presume. Do you feel you can work with Sahir and that he will help you to make good decisions? For some reason which she didn't fully understand, Amy choked up with tears. Yes, she sobbed. I do. Please ask Sahir. Uncle Louie put his arm on her shoulders. I thought you'd choose Sahir, he assured her. Although Kenzie might be a very close second. They shared a smile. Kenzie is very nice. He would be a great second choice, she agreed, wiping her tears away. But he's he's not to hear. Okay, that is true, Uncle Louis chuckled, sensing the deep feelings behind the simple statement. He felt he had his answer. Then I'm giving you permission to ask the here to come with us tonight. I'll need both of you to help me get up and down. Really? Amy clarified with astonishment. I should ask him? They both saw a tall silhouette enter the clearing. Go ask the here to join us, he encouraged. Standing up, Amy was all smiles. Thank you, she said gratefully. Thank you, Uncle Louis. Although he was her brother, Uncle Louis would always be his name. Running off, Amy met Sahir in the clearing. Is everything okay? He questioned with a frown. She nodded, bursting with happiness. Uncle Louie and I are going to talk to the professor, she said quietly, and we want you to come with us. Me? Sahir whispered incredulously. You're, you're asking me? You're going to talk to the professor? In the secret cave? Why? What is this all about? Please come, Amy assured him softly. You'll understand when we get there. Besides, I need your help to get Uncle Louie down the hill. It wasn't an easy descent. Even with Amy and Zaheer on either side of Uncle Louie, he was dizzy and breathing heavily all the way down. How will we get back up the hill, she asked. 
I don't know, the older man replied uneasily. You're doing so well, Uncle Louis, as I hear encouraged. Just one step at a time. We'll make it. Rest when you need to. There's no hurry. Reaching the bottom of the hill, Uncle Louis sat down wearily on the last step. Sahir and Amy rested on either side of him until he was able to catch his breath. Eventually, they pressed on and he stumbled to the cave entrance. Amy pulled out the key from around her neck. Having heard voices the night before, she made sure no one was nearby before unlocking the door. Entering the cave, Zahir looked around curiously. Amy closed the door behind them. Uncle Louis turned on the phone. We might need a couple more chairs, the older man mused regretfully. A whole night of investigation will be hard to take standing up. Do you think you can run back to the mansion and bring a couple down? Amy and Zahir hurried quietly back through the forest to grab two chairs from the girls' mansion. Taking a back way up the hill, they had to climb over several fallen trees. Once they had collected the chairs, they decided to take the stairway down. They were almost to the bottom when suddenly Zahir stopped in front and turned around. Amy nearly ran into him. Hesitating in the shadowy woods, he asked, Amy, why did you ask me to come with you and Uncle Louis? Amy's face flushed bright red, but it was too dark to notice. On the spot and unprepared, she stumbled to find reasons, safe reasons. Because you are the one I choose, she said hesitantly. I know I can trust you and that you will be a good leader, she paused. With a sigh, Zahir's shoulders slumped. He nodded his head. Well, thank you, he said uncertainly. I appreciate it, but what do you mean by good leader? Is this about leadership in paradise? Yes. Then I'm not the best choice, he said firmly. Why not? Amy, he pleaded with an edgy tone of bitterness. I know you said you loved honesty, but things are worse than you think. I'm really not who I used to be or who I thought I was. Amy, I actually regret being kind to Ponzi. How can I regret saving a life? I find myself feeling intensely angry, jealous, resentful, and crying when I have no idea why. I hate these feelings, but I can't get rid of them. How can I be a leader? I'll hurt people's feelings, maybe even yours again. And what if I become completely blind and become a burden on, well, everyone? You should pick Kenzie. Steady, reliable, faithful Kenzie. For so many reasons, Amy, you should pick him. So here... Amy protested. What you're feeling is normal. This is not normal, he exclaimed with dismay. I did some research. You did? How? he challenged. Around them the wind came strongly through the trees. Warily they both glanced up at the swaying branches. You'll find out how to research if you come to the cave, Amy begged. Earnestly she tried to explain. So here, apparently what you're feeling is normal for someone who has gone through permanent physical injuries. Anxiety, depression, regret, it's all a part of healing on the inside. It won't always be like this. Your feelings will settle down. You'll recognize yourself again. Sounding even more discouraged, he reaffirmed, I still think you should choose Kenzie. Amy hesitated. It was the perfect moment to tell her anxious friend exactly how she felt. No one else was around to make things awkward. Love was the most important reason she was choosing him over Kenzie. However, Sahir was not speaking in his usual kind, reassuring way. The bitterness and frustration in his voice undermined her confidence. Even though she was trying to encourage him to remember that he was healing, she was thrown off by his negative reaction to her request. She had fully anticipated he would be grateful for this special opportunity to be on a secret mission with her, but instead he wanted to pass it off to another guy. If he loved her, why would he encourage her to choose Kenzie? It just didn't make sense. Unsure of herself, Amy's head and heart failed to come to a consensus. The wave of doubt hit hard and she faltered. Once again, she opted for safe answers. I, I'd like to choose you, she said uncertainly. Please come tonight, Zaheer. Please see what this is about before you make a decision. Reluctantly, Zaheer moved forward, but Amy's heart sunk. He really doesn't want to do this, she reflected sadly, following him down the hill. As they hurried quietly through the valley between the two hills, 
carrying the chairs and dodging swaying tree branches. She struggled to understand it all. Is there something special between us, she wondered? Or am I just imagining what I want to believe? Oh, what is he here thinking? Does he just lack confidence, or is there something that I don't know about? Maybe he would still rather be with Georgia or someone else. As they reached the cave door, she tried to reassure herself. Once he sees how exciting this is, he'll want to be involved. I'm sure we'll eventually work out things between us. The older tiny let them in and thanked them. Someone has definitely been in here, he frowned as they set the chairs down beside the other. Looking at Amy, he said, The screen is covered in fingerprints and the floor is very dirty. Have you made sure the key is always with you? Amy shook her head meekly. She explained about hiding it under a rock and relayed the conversation she had overheard between Odin, Franz, and Lily. Well, that explains it, he said regretfully. From now on, she showed him her ribbon necklace. I know, she nodded. I always keep it around my neck now. I make sure I pull up my blanket right to my chin. I don't know how Lily gets the key off without waking me up. Uncle Louie frowned. Didn't seem possible to him either. Alarmed by the evidence of intruders, Uncle Louie didn't notice that his potential successors looked very glum. Turning back to the black screen on the wall, he asked Amy to explain the phone functions to hear, which she did in a flat, mechanical way. The older tiny had to point out a few that she didn't know. Finally, he asked Amy to call the professor. Amy selected a video call. Let's meet the professor, Uncle Louis smiled. In an instant, the professor showed up on the screen, and he was looking right at them. Zaheer's bright blue eye opened wide. Awestruck, he was fixated with the screen. It wasn't a still picture. The professor was moving around and looking at them as though he were right with them in the cave. And even though he was the mastermind of paradise... There on the rectangular screen, he didn't appear much bigger than a regular tiny. Hello, Jack said cheerfully. Louis, I'm so glad to see you again. You look really good. And you've got a crew with you tonight, he observed with a pleased expression. Uncle Louis nodded. Amy and I made a decision to include Zaheer, he told him proudly, knowing how much this would mean to his father. I would never have made it to the cave tonight without their help, one on each side. And Amy would like to have a trustworthy friend involved in this process. It's a very big responsibility. So here looked over at Amy with a tinge of alarm, but she didn't meet his gaze. Instead, she was questioning if she had made the right decision. She knew Kenzie would have been fully supportive. Maybe this shouldn't be about who I love the most, she pondered. Maybe I should have chosen the one I work best with. I'm so pleased to see you all, the professor rejoiced with a nod of approval on Uncle Louis's direction. Looking at Zaheer directly, the professor said, You are a courageous young man, Zaheer. I'm very pleased that you saved Ponzi's life when others would have let him die. And you've healed well. Your scar looks terrific. Still not his usual self, Zaheer was completely overwhelmed. Everything was so astonishing to him that he hardly knew what to say. Nodding, he flushed dark red and managed a polite thank you. Unconsciously, his hand reached up to touch his facial wound. Turning his attention to Amy, the professor smiled. Amy, you've excelled at nursing. You've saved lives as well. Amy's response was much the same. Those who show they can serve well are given even bigger opportunities, he smiled. Looking kindly at the oldest tiny, the professor said, Uncle Louis has been a wonderful leader of paradise. I'm sure you will both agree. Amy and Zaheer nodded enthusiastically. Amy put her arm around Uncle Louis's shoulders and smiled up at him. With a deep sigh, the professor added, You know that Uncle Louis is not in good health. Sadly, his time with you is limited. Burying her face in Uncle Louis's shoulder, Amy did not want to talk about it. It's okay, Amy, Uncle Louis said softly, putting his arm around her and pulling her close. We all know this is the case. We must think about the future. Wiping his eyes, the professor continued sadly. For things to function in paradise, there must always be someone who can communicate with me, he explained kindly. Sometimes there are emergencies, and someone needs to message me right away. Sometimes you need special supplies or just some advice. The younger tinies nodded thoughtfully. 
So this is how you always just know things, Sahir so remarked, looking over at Uncle Louie. With a smile, he said, it is. I'm choosing Amy to communicate with me, the professor stated, looking at her directly, and I'm very happy for Zahir to be included as well. I can see that the two of you will make a good team. You've both shown an interest in serving others and caring for their needs. You've both appreciated Uncle Louis's fine example, and I have no doubt you will follow his methods. Being leaders of paradise means putting others' needs above your own. You need to think about what is best for paradise, even if it may not always be what is best for you personally. Serve to lead. Lead by serving. It was a high calling, and at that moment, both team members felt rather uncertain about their future together. Unaware of their inner doubts, Uncle Louis spoke up. Perhaps you could give them the same message you gave me, he said. Maybe you could tell them about the internet. Yes, the professor agreed, looking at the younger tinies. This black box on the wall, he began, is a very powerful tool. You can ask this phone any question you like, and it will give you many detailed answers. However, not all the answers are true, and some are completely false. You need to be very discerning in your investigations. Research carefully, compare answers, and talk things over between yourselves. You will discover many helpful, eye-opening materials. You will learn more than you ever thought possible. You will be able to experience my world, to see it, and to view it in action. But always keep in mind that the internet is to be used as a tool to help and benefit others in paradise. Never use it to harm yourselves or anyone else. With a quick glance, Amy looked over at Sahir. She couldn't wait to see his reaction to all the things she had seen on the phone. It was truly a direct window to the professor's world. How can it harm someone? Sahir asked cautiously. The professor acknowledged his question. Well, what you see may cause you to become discontent with paradise. There is a lot of poisonous material on the internet. This poison can make all other enjoyable aspects of life seem dull and boring. It's a poison that lures you to keep coming back for more, even though you know it is making you feel terrible about yourself and sapping you of the ability to enjoy life's simple pleasures. The younger tiny shared a brief, anxious glance. Nodding at their weary response, the professor had a little more to say. If you come across images or videos that make you feel uncomfortable, shocked, or ashamed, or frightened, he told them, have the wisdom and self-control to turn it off. If you know you wouldn't look at something if Uncle Louis was sitting there beside you, it is likely poisonous material. Don't look at things like that. Make a decision to always, always avoid this dark, intoxicating venom. It's been put online to lure you in and destroy your spirit. Don't give it power over your mind. Frowning, Zahir spoke up. Please explain poison and venom, he requested. I've never heard of those before. With a chuckle, the professor nodded kindly. Of course you haven't, he smiled. In my world, poison is something that is used to make others very sick or even kill them. You remember the spider that entered paradise by mistake, he asked. Amy and Zahir both nodded their heads. The copper-haired girl was thinking about the serpent in the Garden of Eden. His lie was like poison, she thought. Well, the professor told them, venom is the poison that a spider might inject to kill its victim. A spider or a snake, Uncle Louie interjected. Could that spider have killed Rosa and Lily? Amy exclaimed. Yes. Scary stuff, Sahir replied, a little dazed by all he was learning. Uncle Louie told the professor about the worrisome signs that someone had found their way into the cave. Hmm, that isn't good, the professor agreed. Evan and I will look into it. I'm pleased that Amy is now guarding the key more carefully. Looking at her, he said, If you want, you could give it to Zahir for safekeeping. Passing it behind Uncle Louis's back, Amy gratefully handed the key over to Zahir. Really? He questioned uncertainly. Please? She begged. A dark look passed across his face as he reluctantly took the key from her hand. Amy didn't understand why he was so unhappy. She was very disappointed by his reactions to the special mission. Have I made a mistake? She asked herself again. Was I only thinking about my own feelings and not what is best for everyone? 
Ben Zahir asked the professor a question. Is it possible for Amy and me to invite others to join us in this cave? Who do you want to invite? The professor asked curiously. Definitely Kenzie, Zahir stated. He should be here with us tonight. He might wonder where we are. He will be upset tomorrow to hear that he missed out on this. And I don't want to tell him any lies. Uncle Louie and the professor exchanged glances. They hadn't expected such a request. Both missed Amy's elated look of surprise. But the one who made the suggestion did not. I will trust you and Amy to make those decisions, the professor decided hesitantly. As I've warned you, this phone can be used for good or for evil. It was important for all of you to grow up and enjoy living life without this device. However, now you are adults and the internet is a valuable tool for problem solving and educational purposes. It's also a vital way to stay connected with me. If you and Amy can find a way to share the phone and keep everyone safe, then by all means you can do so. Just keep in mind that I don't want anyone to become addicted to the harmful material that is easily accessed or use the phone to discover how to endanger others. Uncle Louisa here and Amy all looked at each other. We can share it? Amy echoed happily. Yes, he smiled as long as you think carefully about how best to keep everyone safe. I realize that trying to keep all these secrets has become cumbersome. I I don't want you to feel you have to lie or be dishonest. We must think of a better way moving forward. Once again, Zahir had an idea. I think it's time for all of us to meet you, Professor, he begged. We could easily divide on so many matters. None of us have a position of respect like Uncle Louie does. Amy and Uncle Louie nodded. Hmm, I have contemplated this possibility, the professor acknowledged. I agree it may help. We should discuss it further. For now, I hope I will hear from you once a day if possible, he said. Evenings or mornings are usually the best for me. We will try, Amy promised with a more cheerful expression. She was greatly relieved that Kenzie would be asked to join them in the cave. Turning to Uncle Louie, the professor said, I'll leave it to you, Louis. Show them how to use the phone in profitable ways. I love you all. Good night, everyone, he smiled. They all returned his good night greeting and waved. Chapter 37. The Investigation I need to know if the Bible is true, Uncle Louie told the two tinies on either side of him. If you aren't too tired, let's investigate tonight. Let's sort this out. I'm fine, Zahir replied. I'm not tired. Same with me, Amy agreed. Earnestly, Zahir requested, Please could I run and get Kenzie? I, I know he would want to be in on this. Since the professor had changed the rule, Uncle Louie readily granted Zahir permission. While they waited for him to return, Uncle Louis showed Amy the Bible app that he had installed on the phone. He demonstrated how to look up passages, search for words or topics of interest, and find detailed meanings of words. I'd love to have this up in the crisis room, Amy exclaimed. It would make it much easier to answer our questions. It would, he agreed hesitantly, but a smartphone in the mansion would create many other problems. Finally, Zahir came back without Kenzie. I couldn't find him, he mumbled, slumping into his chair. I didn't want to wake anyone up. We'll have to tell him about it tomorrow. You'll have plenty of opportunities to share this with him in the future, Uncle Louis assured him. Eager to show them some of the discoveries he had made before the fire, he smiled. Let me take you on an amazing tour. We've heard a lot about the land of Israel while we've been reading the Bible. Let's go there. What? Zahir remarked in surprise. Really? In an instant, Uncle Louis had clicked on Google Earth and typed in Israel. The leaders in training were astonished as they saw the revolving planet glowing bright blue and green against the deep black atmosphere. Quickly, they zoomed closer and closer to the Earth until they reached a brown coastline along the edge of an ocean. Wow! Zahir exclaimed, fully impressed. The earth is enormous. 
For half an hour, Uncle Louis took them to various places they had read about, showing cities on hills, ruins and plains, old mosaic tiles by the seashore, and archaeological digs. So the Bible talks about real places on earth, Zahir expressed eagerly, and we can see them. They really exist. And these locations are described accurately in God's book, Uncle Louis nodded. If the Bible were a fictional account, that may or may not be the case. How will you investigate if the Bible is really true, Amy pondered. Well, this is one way, Uncle Louis assured her. We can research the details that the Bible records and see if they are correct, like the geographical features. But here's another way, the way I've been hoping to explore for a while. Typing into the Google search box bar, Uncle Louis wrote, Is the Bible true? So many hits came up on the screen. Some were articles in full support of the Bible, and some were aggressively against. There is so much to read, Sahir marveled, as Uncle Louis scrolled down the list. There is, Uncle Louis nodded, and I'd like to get through as much as I can tonight. I hope you both can do this with me. I feel we should decide together if there is enough evidence to prove the Bible is a precious message that could educate us and make paradise a better place, or if it is part of the destructive influence that we need to avoid. Some muffled noises suddenly caught their attention. Amy thought she heard someone say something about a light. Zaheer thought he heard Odin. Who is there? Uncle Louis called out loudly. A great deal of scuffling was heard, but no one answered. The noises faded away. Uncle Louis sent a message to the professor, telling him that they had heard noises outside the cave around midnight. Amy and Zaheer were keen to delve into the investigation. The first article Uncle Louis wanted to read claimed there were more than a thousand contradictions in the Bible. This is one of the professor's foremost arguments against the Bible, he relayed. I have to read this through. Remembering that this issue had come up in one of their earliest discussions about the Bible, Amy and Zaheer were curious. As they skimmed through the article, which listed the top hundred contradictions in the Bible, they found the differences to be mostly small spelling mistakes, numbers that weren't the same in both accounts, and details that had been recorded in one place and not another. Apparently, not all scribes had hand-copied the manuscripts with 100% accuracy. However, the majority of differences, called variants, between the accounts were mostly tiny, insignificant errors that did not affect any important Bible teaching. Looking at articles in support of the Bible's accuracy, Amy read from an article entitled, Isn't the Bible Full of Contradictions? She read, It is important to stress that the degree to which these manuscripts agree far outweighs the degree to which they disagree, and none of the discrepancies concern major theological issues. Nevertheless, both the Old and New Testaments have a range of variant readings scattered throughout. One reason for this is that the scribes made errors as they copied the manuscripts across the centuries. The contradiction regarding Jehoiachin's age is probably this type of error. Later, another article caught their eye under How Accurate is the Bible, which said, Because of the great reverence the Jewish scribes held toward the scriptures, they exercised extreme care in making new copies of the Hebrew Bible. The entire scribal process was specified in meticulous detail to minimize the possibility of even the slightest error. The number of letters, words, and lines were counted, and the middle letters of the Pentateuch and the Old Testament were determined. If a single mistake was discovered, the entire manuscript would be destroyed. As a result of this extreme care, the quality of the manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible surpasses all other ancient manuscripts. The 1947 discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls provided a significant check on this because these Hebrew scrolls predate the earliest Masoretic Old Testament manuscripts by about a thousand years. But in spite of this time span, the number of variant readings between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic text is quite small, and most of these are variations in spelling and style. One article went on to describe several insertions found in later New Testament manuscripts, but not in the earliest records. Again, most of these weren't longer than one verse, but two were significant sections. It was possible, they read, that the account of the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 7 
had been inserted at a later point in time, as well as verses 9 to 20 in the last chapter of Mark's Gospel. However, these later insertions did not impact any essential gospel teaching and weren't vital to establish any doctrinal truth. Among the four gospel accounts, there were also some small variations. For instance, Mark recorded one angel was at Jesus' tomb, while Luke recorded two. But Mark didn't say there was only one. He simply referred to only one. Other so-called contradictions were also of little significance, and as one article stated, when verifying authentic eyewitness accounts, it is realistic for there to be small discrepancies, depending on what details the eyewitness felt were significant. But none of the variations directly contradicted one another in any essential matter. As they scanned various articles, they discovered that each gospel writer shared a unique perspective on Jesus, which meant that different details of his life were important to include in one book, but not in others. For example, Matthew set out to prove Jesus was the Messiah and referred to scores of Old Testament prophecies that he had fulfilled. Mark wrote about his experiences as a suffering servant. Luke was writing to a Gentile audience and was concerned with chronology, listing many specific historical details. John's Gospel was reported to be the most theological, using very spiritual language to describe the Son of God. All four had different themes and audiences to address. One article stated that if everything matched up perfectly, it could indicate collaboration with the intention to deceive, rather than an honest recounting of the event from unique perspectives. Uncle Louis summed up the supportive article, saying, We may not have the original manuscripts, but it seems to me that for so many thousands of copies, to be essentially the same message in all languages and parts of the world, this is powerful evidence that the Bible was copied accurately. We can read it with the assurance that we have God's essential message. Well, that answers one question in my journal, Amy smiled. Her reluctant teammate, who was becoming more intrigued as the night wore on, found a quote that he wanted to read. It had been taken from a book called Another Gospel. He read, One of the traits of authentic eyewitness testimony that historians look for in ancient writings is called the criterion of embarrassment. It basically means that one of the ways we can judge whether someone was telling the truth is if they didn't leave out embarrassing details about themselves or their story. In this way, the Gospels are incredibly embarrassing. That's interesting. Uncle Louis agreed, repeating, historians look for a criterion of embarrassment. Reading more of the quote out loud, he pondered the concepts. If someone wants to promote themselves on social media, he read, they will generally only record their best experiences. They will show everything in the most attractive way possible, hide or delete mistakes, foolish reactions, ugly expressions, failures, and so on. However, the gospel accounts, and really the whole Bible, portray human life with all the good and bad. Jesus' disciples sometimes argued about who would be the greatest. Sometimes their attempts to heal didn't have any effect because they lacked faith. They often didn't understand the simple things Jesus was trying to teach them, like leaven representing hypocrisy, or even that their master had to die when he had explained it clearly on numerous occasions. They ran away in fear when Jesus needed them most. Sometimes Jesus had to rebuke them for trying to persuade him to disobey God's will for his life. If those disciples had written the Gospels on their own, in an attempt to start a new religion, maybe hoping it would bring them fame, money, power, or help to overthrow the governing bodies, would they write themselves into the stories with all their foolish actions revealed? Or, the older tiny read thoughtfully, Did God want the authors to purposely record the moments of weakness to encourage everyone that mistakes can be forgiven? I like that, Sahir agreed enthusiastically. It is encouraging to read about the disciples' mistakes and lack of courage. It does give us hope. Nodding Uncle Louis added, I'm thankful God has shown us the good and the bad. It helps us to remember that our Father in Heaven doesn't expect us to be perfect, just humble enough to admit our mistakes and try better the next time. With a sigh of relief, Uncle Louis settled back happily. 
These questions had been bothering him since the first day he had heard that there were thousands of contradictions. Well, I don't see anything that directly contradicts the essential message, he remarked confidently. Nothing is substantially inconsistent from one book to the next. There are just many insignificant differences among the thousands of manuscripts due to spelling mistakes, missed details, and a few insertions made at a later date. I think that is quite acceptable for a book that is so old. Amy recalled another point she had read. Or there are some things that look like disagreements, but when we examine them carefully, we find the variations enhance our understanding of the account. So here was eagerly scrolling through more articles and found one claiming that highly advanced medical instructions to ward off contagious disease were recorded in the earliest books of the Bible, thousands of years before modern science had discovered them. Under the heading, The Public Health Value of the Law of Moses, the article claimed that the medical requirements in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were in keeping with the latest understandings of medical science known to be most important in stopping the spread of infection among groups of people and avoiding the entry of contaminants into the human body. The Law of Moses directed the use of running water for cleansing hands, bodies, clothes, and bedding, isolation to prevent disease from spreading, advised against using any standing water into which a dead organism had fallen, thus appreciating the spread of bacteria. There were warnings concerning the danger and growth of mold, and many regulations against eating unclean animals prone to parasites and contamination. All these excellent health rules have been written down nearly 4,000 years ago in the Bible, long before humans had discovered organisms that were invisible to the human eye, such as germs, spores, and viruses. Even though modern science had only fully adopted and understood these safe measures in the last few centuries, they had been recommended in the Bible for millennia. So, if these laws had been followed, Zahir marveled, reading further, it would have saved many people from dying of cholera, dysentery, fever, and other highly contagious diseases, whatever they are. Curiously, they investigated some of the diseases mentioned in the article and hoped that paradise was never infected with any of them. Amy was impressed that the Bible's health instructions still held true thousands of years later, even with all the advancements in scientific knowledge. Uncle Louis found another article that listed all the foolish notions that people had believed over the years, which they thought were helpful ways to cure various illnesses. Lobotomy, bloodletting, electric coils, and radioactive water were some of the medical suggestions now referred to as quackery. Drilling holes in people's skulls to let out evil demons sounded terrible to Amy. It's hard to believe people actually thought that would help, she exclaimed. This is all really significant, Zahir marveled. If unsafe health practices were promoted in the Bible, that would demonstrate that it was written by people who didn't know what they were talking about and were just passing along the popular ideas of the day. For the Bible's health practices to still be effective 4,000 years later is good evidence that whoever wrote it had a perfect understanding from the start. It is a very good proof, Uncle Louis agreed. It is a very good proof, Uncle Louis agreed. As it says here, the law of Moses was even far ahead of 19th century science. The importance of hand-washing was not understood even 300 years ago. Really? So he remarked. And that just makes basic good sense. You learn the hard way, Uncle Louis smiled. The dark-haired tiny agreed. Yes, I sure did. Amy smiled. Her hands had never been so clean as they had in the last three weeks. Hour by hour, they sifted through articles both for and against. Some reviews the older tiny had already seen before the fire, so he readily summarized them. Others they all read together. They examined an article that tried to disprove God had created the world in six days. Uncle Louis wasn't impressed by the suggested alternative that everything had started with simple life and gradually evolved from one organism into another. That sounds like the professor's book, he said. How can they prove that this is the way life began? No human being was there at the beginning to witness evolution. Another article clarified the matter, saying, 
If God didn't create the universe, then who or what did? Likely, any evolutionary answer to that question will involve a force that is uncreated, self-existent, and capable of creating. Atheists believe that the material world always existed. Creationists believe that God always existed. The atheist view on the origin of life is no more probable or scientific than the creationists. To believe that the material world always existed is an unprovable assumption based on faith. Looking at a review of a movie called Dismantled, Uncle Louie read, Avoid speculation on anything that can't be experimentally verified. Evolution is a historical theory about the beginning of life. It is not a scientific theory because it cannot be verified through experiment. There's so much to discover, Sahir blurted out somewhat anxiously. We could spend weeks down here. We could, Uncle Louie agreed. But we don't want to be consumed by all that is available. We just need enough information to answer the questions we have at the moment. This can be overwhelming. They skimmed through articles on the consistency of the Bible message, which relayed that many different authors had received God's words and carefully recorded them over a period of about 2,000 years. The message, the theme, the symbols, the hope, and the lessons were reported to be consistent from beginning to end. Such consistency would be very difficult, if not impossible, for so many human beings to keep right over such a long period of time. So, the Bible is a collection of many different books written by many different people, Amy considered? Yes, replied Uncle Louis. Reflecting on the articles, he said, I agree that a consistent message across so many centuries is solid proof that God is really the author and the people who were involved only recorded what God told them to write. How else could they all be in agreement with one another? So here noticed a quote from the Bible, which said, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And then they found an article on the way in which Bible prophecy proved divine inspiration. As the hours flew by, the excited Tanis examined Old Testament prophecies concerning Tyre, Egypt, and Babylon, each time taking a fascinating tour with Google Earth to see where each place was and how it looked in the 21st century. Babylon was stark. In Jeremiah 51, God had said it would never be rebuilt. They looked at the ruins of the great city, broken down and sticking up out of the mounds of sand. Apparently, it had once been one of the most beautiful places on earth. Googling Babylon, they visited the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, and were awestruck by the fascinating blue brick walls with lion decorations. They read about a man called Saddam Hussein, who wanted to rebuild the city and started the process, but lost his life before getting far along in his renovations. Babylon was still a city of ruins, just as the Bible had predicted. It was Uncle Louis who found information on Bible prophecies concerning Israel, which he had heard Evan mention while he lay in the emergency bed. Outside the cave, dawn was breaking as they read about Ezekiel's prophecy of Israel's demise and regathering. They also read that because the Jewish people had refused to follow God's laws, they had been scattered throughout the world, and their capital city, Jerusalem, had been downtrodden by other nations until the regathering in the 1900s. This is all recent history, Zahir repeated, fascinated. Yes, the older tiny nodded. The Jewish people have become a nation again in their own land after 2,000 years of suffering, just like God said. Amy was reading on in the article. And look, she said, one of these prophecies speaks of God's son, Jesus Christ, returning to be the king. Returning to this planet Earth? Sahir asked with astonishment. Will he come back down from heaven? Will we get to meet him? Amy wondered looking over at Zahir with eager anticipation. It's all a part of these prophecies in Ezekiel and Zechariah, Uncle Louis exclaimed. If so much of it has already come true, then surely the rest will as well. He pondered thoughtfully. I believe the whole Bible either stands or falls together. All the way through, this book claims to be a direct revelation from God. 
where God spoke and people recorded his message. Typing a few words that he remembered into the search bar of the Bible app, he found 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, and read the passage out loud. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Looking at his helpers, he said, either the Bible is what it claims to be, or it is an extremely well-designed fraud. I think we have found very good evidence to believe this book is true, Zahir proclaimed. I don't agree with the professor's objections. I believe it is true as well, Uncle Louis nodded. So, that means that I have to act on it while I still can. What do you mean? Amy asked. What do you need to do? Uncle Louis searched for the word baptized and quickly found Acts 22. They read, And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. I want to be baptized, he said. God has granted me an extension of life, but I don't know how much longer I have. Looking at them both earnestly, Uncle Louis said, Amy and Zahir, I need you to help me to get to the lake. I need you to put me under the water, but keep me from drowning, he smiled. I need to confess my sins and commit my life to God and his son. Do you think you could help me, please? Now? Zahir asked. Yes, this is the best time, Uncle Louis smiled. You've already helped me down the hill. We just have to walk to the lake. Chapter 38 Into the Lake It was a long journey in the sunrise to get to the lake. Leaning on their shoulders, Uncle Louis hobbled along slowly with frequent rests. Beautiful golden-edged clouds stretched across the sky. Pale pinks and blues melded into one another behind the crisscrossed expanse. Colorful lorikeys swooped over the sparkling, rippled water, riding breezy currents of air. Loons called out, beating their wings against the surface as they rose up out of the lake. Once the water lapped gently against their feet, Uncle Louis breathed deeply with a peaceful smile. We've made it, he said. Looking up to the sky, he rejoiced, Father, I'm so thankful you've brought me to this. Following his direction, Amy and Zahir waded out with Uncle Louis, deeper and deeper, until the water reached past his waist. Then Uncle Louis stopped. Resting his hands on their shoulders, he prayed, My Father in heaven, he said, I am so thankful that you have blessed us here in paradise with your life-changing message and your incredible hope of salvation. I am so thankful that you have extended my life to learn about you and that I am no longer alone in this quest. You have answered my prayers in astonishing ways. I confess that there is so much that I still don't know. I pray you would help Zahir, Amy, and Kenzie to understand your ways and bring everyone in paradise to you. And I beg that you would open the professor's eyes, that he may also find your salvation. Heavenly Father, today I confess all my sinful thoughts and failures to you. I pray for forgiveness for times of impatience with those in my care, and for things I viewed online that I completely regret. I know that you see every thought and examine our motivations, I recognize my need for forgiveness through the willing sacrifice of your Son. I believe in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I love the example he left for us to follow. I earnestly look forward to the day when your Son will return and raise the dead to immortality. I want to be there, Father. I long to see your kingdom established on this earth. Please accept me as one of your children today. Please remember me when you call the dead to rise? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, your loving and obedient Son, I pray. Amen. Opening his eyes, Uncle Louis smiled at the wide-eyed tinies. Now you can put me under, he said, completely under. Zahir and Amy put their arms around him securely. They tipped Uncle Louis backwards until the water came up over his head. 
Then they brought him back up, sputtering and coughing a little. Are you okay? Amy questioned anxiously. With a radiant smile, Uncle Louis looked at them both. I've never been better. Now I can go in peace. Looking up to the sky, he spread his arms out and said, Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your graciousness to me. As they helped him wade back to shore, Amy saw that tears were streaming down Zaheer's face once again. Uncle Louis's prayer had been deeply moving. She was impressed with her elderly brother's example that this was the way to forgiveness, confessing your sins and committing your life to Christ in baptism. She was very intrigued to learn more. One phrase troubled her, and she asked uncertainly, Uncle Louis, what do you mean by go in peace? We still need you. We can't do this on our own. Stumbling out of the water, Uncle Louis shook his head. You're not alone. You have each other. Treasure your friendship and each other's insights. You have Kenzie and Ponzi, Evan and Seth. And most importantly, you now know that you have a heavenly father, the creator of the world and his son. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Breathing heavily, Uncle Louis pointed to the sand, and they all sat down together. You're not alone. Not anymore, he panted. You have more on your side than I ever did. And yet, I had all that I needed. Suddenly, he groaned in agony and brought his hand over to grip his left arm. Sorry, he said weakly. I need to lie down. Amy and Zaheer helped him to lie back in the warm sand. Uncle Louis's face became ashen. The sun had risen above the hazy horizon and the beach boys were rising too. Damien and Georgia were walking along the beach with their arms around each other. Curious, they drew closer to see what was going on. Uncle Louis was breathing fine and his heart was still pumping, but his eyes were closed. We need to get the stretcher to get him back home, Zaheer fretted anxiously. He's exhausted. Is he dying? Georgia inquired with a worried expression. Her long blonde hair shone brilliantly in the early morning sun. Amy shook her head. No, just sleeping, she replied, anxiously observing the older tiny's gray face and keeping her hand in his heart. But he's not doing well. Looking up at Damien, Zaheer begged, Could one of you please run up Rainbow Hill and bring us the stretcher? Uncle Louie needs help getting back up to the mansion. Well... What were you dunking him under the water for, Scarman? Damien replied dismissively. That was risky. Look, I've got three people coming for morning swims in a few minutes. What's wrong with your legs? Zaheer didn't respond, but suddenly Lima dashed over. I'll get the stretcher, he offered. You stay here and help Uncle Louie. Looking up gratefully, Amy watched their tall, dark friend tear off toward the hill. She wondered if he had seen the baptism. Come on, Gorgio, let's get in, Damien called out, picking his blonde girlfriend up in his arms and racing into the water. Feeling the spray, Amy and Zaheer sat in the warm sand beside their uncle and dear friend. Holding Uncle Louis's hand, monitoring his pulse, and hoping he wouldn't stop breathing, they waited anxiously for Lima's return. Resentment burned in Amy's heart as she considered Damien's refusal to help, and his derogatory name for Zaheer. Don't let his names bother you she whispered. I love your scars. The dark-haired young man on the other side of Uncle Louie didn't look up, but he shook his head dismally. Amidst the laughter as the two swimmers frolicked in the lake, Uncle Louie spoke softly. Let me go now, he begged. Don't try to revive me. I have... I have found the greatest treasure. In a few minutes, Lima came running back, carrying the stretcher. Kenzie and Ponzi were close behind. Together, they all managed to get Uncle Louie back up the hill and safely into his bed. Half asleep and worn out, Uncle Louie was thankful for soft pillows and a comfortable place to rest. He fell asleep immediately. Zaheer flopped into his own bed nearby. Good night, he said wearily. I am so tired. Ponzi left to get breakfast, but Kenzie was puzzled. Why did you take Uncle Louie down to the lake? He questioned Amy. I came up this morning to an empty room. I didn't know where anyone was. Uncle Louie wanted to be baptized, Amy replied joyfully. Baptized? Kenzie echoed. 
So he's sure the Bible is true? We spent the whole night researching here? No, in the cave, Amy explained. The cave where I go to talk to the professor. Kenzie frowned. I wish I'd been included. Zaheer looked up wearily. I tried to find you, he implored. I looked all over. I knew you would want to be on it. Did you look up on Mining Hill? No, Zaheer replied. Why were you up there? That's the farmer's lookout, Kenzie smiled. I was... I was talking to Vanitha. It's probably just as well that you didn't find me. Is she really upset? Zaheer questioned. Yes, she is. We talk for hours. Amy saw a blissful glow spread across Kenzie's face. She was pleased to see his happiness. For a moment, no one was sure what to say. Then Zaheer promised, We'll take you to the cave, Kenzie. We'll show you everything we learned, he yawned. For now, I'm so tired. The yawn was contagious. Amy couldn't stop herself. Covering her mouth, she took a few steps toward Lily's room. We have so much to tell you, she added. But right now, I need to get some sleep, too. No wonder you're both exhausted, their curly-haired friend smiled. Have a good sleep. Chapter 39. A Mystery Resolved Evan arrived early that morning, having been awoken by a cheerful bird outside his window. He and Jax had planned to meet at nine and discuss the possible breach in the cave security, planning to get a head start on their investigation by scrolling through the internet history. He strode into the paradise room just as the sun was rising. Rays of sunlight were streaming through the greenhouse glass and sparkling across the water. He stopped for a moment to admire the beautiful scene. Movement in the lake caught his eye, and to his great surprise, he saw Amy and Zaheer on either side of Uncle Louie as they all waded in. What is happening here? He wondered curiously. He drew closer. Over the speakers came the most heartfelt prayer. It sent a shiver down his spine. Uncle Louie was asking to be part of God's family and submitting to baptism. Evan was enthralled. Pulling out his phone, the tall assistant took pictures as he watched the proceedings, pleased to see that the older tiny had discovered the gospel message and the hope that God offers to the whole world. He certainly has been reading the Bible, he said to himself. I'm so thankful we were able to send it in. Quickly, he sent the pictures off to Seth, knowing that his friend would be ecstatic. It was alarming for the young researcher when Uncle Louis collapsed on the beach. Evan was distressed by Damien's unwillingness to help and his unkind name for Zaheer. He was thankful that Lima once again was ready and willing to help. Riveted to the dome, he watched the tinies move the older man to a stretcher and get him back up the hill. Seth texted back, This is the best news ever. I'm so glad you were there to see it. Thanks to an early morning bird, Evan typed in. Otherwise, I would have missed it. Once Uncle Louie was back in the caring center and Damien was running his lively surfing lessons with Georgia and Dia, the tall blonde scientist saw Vanitha ascend Mining Hill alone. The dusky girl with the long black hair was crying. Poor Vanitha. Her heart is broken, he murmured, wishing he could talk to her. He knew exactly how she felt. Right now, she can't imagine it will ever heal, but it will. If I were her dad, I'd be really happy for that sweet girl to find a loving, committed friend. I hope her heartbreak leads to someone who will appreciate her value. With an hour to go before he was due to meet with the professor, Evan took a moment to count all the fallen trees. They had lost about a third of all that they had planted. On the steep side of Rainbow Hill, over a hundred lay dying. It was a sad brown blemish on the rolling green landscape. He was glad to see the farmers were using some of the dead timber to build walls around their chickens. It would be a while before the tiny trees the professor had germinated would be big enough to be sent in and planted by the tinies. 
the newly programmed wind stress would help them develop much stronger roots. Sitting down at the computer, Evan searched the files of recorded internet history. What he found disturbed him greatly. Jacks arrived whistling a happy tune. It was the first time Evan had heard him whistle, and he looked up in surprise. Guess who was in the cave with Louie last night, the gray-haired researcher boasted to his assistant. Amy and Zaheer have finally worked it all out, I think, he smiled happily. You sound a little unsure. Yes, well, they didn't seem as happy as they thought they might, but they were together. So Amy has chosen Zaheer, Evan reiterated. Yes, I knew she would eventually. It just took time. Turning around in the office chair, Evan nodded happily. He didn't tell Jax about the baptism or what he'd just discovered on the computer files. He decided to allow his mentor a moment to savor his long-awaited good news. But with a wry grin, he added, Yes, time, and a little suffering. Suffering? The last few weeks have changed the dynamics in paradise in ways that nothing else seemed to affect. Professor nodded slowly, but he didn't respond. Zaheer will be an excellent leader, he declared, very pleased with the situation. He has already made wise suggestions to the way we've handled the phone. Such as? Well, he and Amy would like to share the phone with others. He doesn't want to lie about it. I explained my concerns and left it up to them to figure it out. That's a huge task. The tinies are now adults, Jax reflected. And as I hoped... They've learned to enjoy life without artificial entertainment. Louis won't be doing school with them anymore unless he improves dramatically. We need a better way, a more open way, for all of them to continue their education. And it seems that the phone has already been discovered by those who would use it for harm. The secret is already out. So we will need to work with them all. Evan agreed. He asked about the key, and the professor told him that Amy had entrusted it to Zaheer. They both surmised that Lily may have been taking the key at night while her roommate was asleep. We should have put a coat on the door instead of a lock, Jax regretted. Well, we can put a coat on the phone. Yes, we can, Jax agreed. First, let's see what happens tonight. Right now, I'd like to make a journal entry and then investigate a little, he said. Well, first you need to look at this, Evan said sadly, pointing to the computer. Striding over, the professor looked at what Evan showed him on the screen. He was shocked to discover how many terrible sites had been visited, even with the website blocker in place. He was alarmed by the many hours of YouTube videos that had been watched. Shaking his head, he murmured, Sal, Morse, so this has all been taking place between the hours of midnight and four in the morning? No wonder they can't wake up till lunch. Why didn't I think to check this out before? Looking up at Evan with despair, he answered his own question. I suppose I thought I'd put enough safeguards in place. I didn't think this was possible. Scrolling through the records, the professor was horrified to realize the early morning access had been taking place even before the fire. It had been happening for nearly two months. Initially, the sites were mostly educational or simply entertaining, with only the occasional red flag. After the fire... There had been a two-day hiatus, but in the following weeks, the quality of hits had quickly degenerated. Oh, la la, what are we going to do about this, he despaired. It's quite serious, Evan agreed. Let's do our journaling while we think about it, Jack suggested, looking very pale. Taking Taking their black books from off the shelf, the professor and Evan headed to the north side of Paradise, In his book, Jax jotted April 30th at the top of his page. It had been a full three weeks since the fire. We've had a serious breach of security, he began, listing out everything they knew or assumed so far. I've made a huge mistake thinking I could keep the phone a secret. I should have realized they would all discover it one day. I needed to prepare them to choose good over evil. I just didn't think it would come to this so soon or that children raised in such a wholesome world would want to look at such perversion. Once he had detailed the types of sites that had been visited and lamented over the loss of their innocence, Jax looked in at the charred trees, wondering if Odin and Franz were awake. He observed all the changes that had taken place and then wrote, 
The forest has been cleaned up and is now being revamped as an adventure park. They call it the Fun Forest. I see rope swings, a target practice, treetop treks, and a ball launcher which is incredibly well designed. I was quite surprised by the creativity displayed in this forest. But sadly, I now know that these marvelous ideas came from unsupervised use of the internet. Quite behind in his journaling, the professor continued to write. Odin initially took full responsibility for the damage he did and had a remarkable change of attitude. He helped tremendously in the first two days and was receiving a lot of positive feedback from the others. Once he found the ruby, he felt it paid off his debt to the community and he slipped backwards again. He is rarely seen outside of the forest aside from meals. There have been confrontations between him and Damien, and I am concerned it may end up in serious blows. Odin is now seen more often with Franz and with Ponzi, but, of course, his old friend was restricted to the caring center to heal. Apparently, Ponzi and Lily plan to get married. Surprisingly, weddings have become a popular idea among the tinies, another result of their investigations online, and a more positive one. Evan stood nearby examining the same area and noted in his book, Today... On April 30th, Uncle Louis was baptized in the lake. His prayer of confession and commitment was wonderful. Amy and Zaheer helped him and witnessed the event. I'm sure it will have a huge impact on them. The Bible could have a powerful influence on everyone in paradise. On a tragic note, I confirmed today that some of the Tanis have found a way to access the cave and use the phone for evil. I am disappointed how quickly they chose perverse material and I am fearful for the impact this will have. We are bound to have some behavioral problems now that there is a knowledge and a desire for these activities. I assume Lily borrowed the key from Amy when she was asleep. The professor has also given Amy and Sahir permission to share the phone with everyone, so all of this will begin an interesting new phase in our experiment. In the North Forest, actually the Fun Forest now, they are creating an upscale target practice, and Franz has figured out how to make bows and arrows. Very well-made bows and arrows. I'm sure I'll find the exact pattern online. We now know why this group often misses breakfast and arrives yawning at lunchtime. They've spent half the night awake. As they both stood nearby on the other side of the glass, the trap door in the ground opened up and Odin stumbled out. Waking up grouchy, Odin began using choice words. Evan and the professor looked at each other sadly. There was no doubt where he had learned the foul language. Glancing back at the piles of dirt and nearby shovels, it suddenly occurred to Evan that Odin was a tunneler. He had built an underground den. Is there any chance they might have dug their way into the cave? He whispered anxiously. That would be a substantial feat. Immediately, the two scientists walked over to Rainbow Hill and examined it carefully. With all the trees lying in messy piles, it was almost impossible to see if there might be a hole in the ground. However, they noticed a faint trail in the grass that led from the north forest behind Cascading Mountain right to the back of the hill in question. I'm going to stay up tonight, the professor stated firmly. I'm going to see what's happening when we aren't watching. Conflicted in his mind, Evan asked tentatively, Do you mind if I head home? My mom is expecting me to be at a barbecue this afternoon, and we're having steak. Enjoy your barbecue, the professor laughed. I'll call you if I need your help. Thanks, Evan said as he turned to leave. On his way out of the biosphere, he thought to himself, The internet can be such a great resource for good. It has been the source of our communication, Louis's education, and so many of the most important things that the Tinies have learned. Our first little man may never have found God's book without it. But what is available online can also lead someone into the very depths of evil. It all depends on the choices that are made. Instead of locked doors and secrets, we should have been developing strong consciences. Chapter 40. In the Night. 
Having picked up dinner at the Reptile Cafe, the professor sat down at his desk to enjoy the bowl of shrimp chowder and one very large Americano, which he hoped would help him stay awake for most of the night. He made himself comfortable at his desk. The soup was delicious. Online, there were plenty of scientific debates to watch and articles on intelligent design to read. Deep into his own investigation, his mind was opening up to new possibilities that he hadn't yet discussed with anyone. He intended to make good use of his time. Turning up all the speakers that were linked into the microphones in paradise, the professor settled into his work. He wanted to make sure he didn't miss any suspicious noises, especially from near the cave. With his eyes on the screen, he began reading the transcript of a recent debate. We can only know to be true what science has demonstrated, the atheist began. Anything that science cannot methodically examine cannot be known to exist. But you can't explain the existence of DNA by purely natural causes, the creation scientist reasoned. How did simple atoms write their own elaborate software? How did the four-dimensional genome form itself in such perfect fashion? You know that it's impossible for information to come from nothing, Yet you believe that the vast variety of self-reproducing, complex life forms simply evolved? Which is more impossible? An intelligent, supernatural creator designing everything you see? Or a primordial soup struck by a source of unguided, meaningless energy forming the very building blocks of life? Your ideas on the origin of life are no more scientific or probable than mine. You are still left with an unprovable assumption based on faith. Uncomfortably, Jack shifted in his chair. As he read the debate, his ears were tuned into paradise, and the speakers were picking up even the most distant voices. He could hear all the laughter from Rose's Hill, Odin's foul language in the fun forest, and even the four tinies in the caring center as they read from Genesis chapter 6. Looking over briefly, he was surprised to see Lima and Santa on the swinging bench just below Amy's open window. Are they listening in? he wondered or just enjoying their own private conversation. Tonight, Sahir was reading, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The great catastrophe, the professor thought to himself, as he saved the interesting debate to his files. Six chapters into the first book of the Bible, and God destroys his whole creation. I just don't get it. Inside the crisis room, he faintly heard Amy ask, How many years after creation did God bring this flood? Uncle Louis had looked into this when he first began to read the Bible. Around 1,500 years had passed before the flood, he replied. That's a lot of years, and people were living much, much longer than they do today. That's 250 times our lifespan, Zaheer chuckled, now wide awake, having slept most of the day. Kenzie and Amy marveled. And this flood surrounded the whole earth, the curly-haired nurse questioned. They looked at the record more carefully, noting that God intended to destroy everything that breathed everything under the heaven and on the whole earth. Forty days and nights of rain, Zaheer noted. That's a lot. Our little world was nearly submerged in a few hours. And what does it say about the mountains? Uncle Louie prodded. Reading from chapter 7, Zaheer replied, All the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep. If water covered all the mountains under the whole heaven, that indicates to me that the whole earth was covered, Uncle Louis answered. Water always seeks a level. In agreement, Sahir read the next few verses. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark. Sounds like every land animal that wasn't on the ark died, Kenzie observed. Why would God destroy his whole creation? Amy asked. 
It says that he was sorry that he made people, Zahir suggested. Uncle Louis spoke up, and it says that God was greatly distressed that his earth was filled with violence, and that humans had corrupted their way, and their imaginations were filled with evil. I wonder how this happened, Kenzie mused. How did they get to this very bad state? On the other side of the glass, the professor stopped his research for a moment to listen to the discussion. How did humans become so bad back then, he wondered. This was long before the invention of the internet. How did they develop these terrible imaginations? What influenced them? Zahir was looking closely at the Bible. There's another one of those references written in the margin, he said. I'll look it up. Certainly, Uncle Louis encouraged. Finding Mark chapter 7, Zahir read the passage. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Surprise, Kenzie clarified. All this evil is from our own hearts? Uncle Louis nodded and explained, Ever since Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, human beings fell from the very good state in which God had made them. Since that day there has been a sinful side in every one of us that can easily be inflamed by what we think about and do. Or we can choose to restrain it with God's help and the influence of goodness into our lives. Amy was thinking it through. So, at the time of the flood, all the people were choosing to follow their evil imaginations, she pondered. All except Noah? That must have been a scary world. I don't think I'd want to live in a place full of violence and corruption. On the other side of the glass, the professor reflected. When I first set paradise in motion, I thought all the tinies would choose good, since they would never see evil. Yet, he pondered thoughtfully, most of those evils from the heart have shown up in paradise. Thankfully, we haven't had a murder yet, but there have been threats. Odin and France have made weapons, and now some are choosing perverse behavior. What would I do if paradise became full of evil? What would I do if some tinies were afraid to live in their own world? What if there were only a few who cared about doing good and they were under attack? As he considered the scenario, the professor could feel his blood pressure rising. It had been easy enough in the past to condemn God for wiping out countless people and animals and making so many rules. But now, with his anxious thoughts about what some of his tinies were choosing to enjoy, he recognized that a world full of violence and wicked imaginations, such as he had heard described in Genesis, would be a terrifying place to live. As humans dismissed their high calling and chose to give in to their own selfish desires, more and more rules would need to be added and enforced. Amy didn't make her regular call that night. He could hear the occupants of the crisis room read a chapter from his book. For the first time ever, he squirmed uneasily with his own strong language. His daughter read, Religion is damaging to the human psyche as it encourages us to accept foolish notions as truth. The concept of faith is applauded by Christians as something we should strive to develop, yet it leads many to accept antiquated, unprovable superstitions as hard facts. Christianity developed when humanity was still ignorant of the great scientific discoveries that have now revolutionized the modern world. We now know and understand the mechanisms behind natural forces and are no longer mystified by powerful storms, floods, and earthquakes once attributed to a higher being. We now understand mental illnesses and are no longer so foolish as to think that supernatural forces are behind schizophrenia and epilepsy. Scientists today would not be dazzled by the miracles recorded in the Bible. They know everything can be explained by natural causes. While well, magic shows are a source of entertainment, even for those who understand it is all about a cunning sleight of the hand, a magician deceives only those who are so ignorant as to believe he is some great one. In reality, he has no more power than you or me. Yet from what I have observed in religious circles, the less evidence available to believe in a higher being, the more faith is put forth as a virtue. 
Jacks frowned. I don't feel the same bitterness that I once did, he thought. I worded things rather harshly back then. But faith is based on evidence, Amy argued. That's why we did so much research. And we found evidence, Sahir added, powerful evidence. Then hold on to it, Uncle Louie encouraged. And let's pray that the professor goes in search for evidence as well. On the other side of the glass, the professor nodded his head slowly. Well, he is searching, he smiled. So we'll see if this old radical skeptic can reasonably sort through what he finds. As he continued to make his way through various online articles, discarding some and riveted to others, he heard the Tinies react in shock to some of the statements they were reading in his book. Often he agreed with their sentiments, not his own. I might need to write a new book, he smiled sadly. I don't agree with myself anymore. Eventually, the Tinies began to tell Kenzie about all they had discovered down in the cave the night before. Occasionally, Jax looked up the evidence they were discussing and read the articles through himself. Little by little, his perspective was changing. There was a powerful case on the creation side that he wished he'd examined more thoroughly years ago. When the talking ceased around 1130, he heard Amy say goodnight to the others as she headed to bed. Approximately half an hour of peaceful quiet settled in across paradise as the professor continued to research. A few loons called out, a cow mood. Snores echoed from the farmland. There were a few groans from the mansion. And then the professor heard a soft thump. Walking over to peer into the dome, he could see movement by the caring center. In the glow from the twinkle lights, a petite figure was running off into the forest. Lily was awake. Watching her run down the hill and across the meadow, Jax was fairly sure where she was heading. In a couple minutes, she had reached the north forest, not quietly on both Ponzi's cabin and Odin's den. A few minutes later, Odin, France, Ponzi, and Lily were scurrying around the back of Cascading Mountain. Glancing at his phone, the professor saw that it was just after midnight. I get to see my show first, Odin was whispering loudly. I love those shoot 'em ups We'll have to figure out how to make guns for the fun forest. Guns and cars, France added. Only there wouldn't be enough room to drive a fast car anywhere. And to think we thought go-karting was fun, Odin added. Yeah, paradise is way too small. Odin chuckled. We have to get out of here. We are definitely missing out in the good life. Throwing in a few choice words, he added, We live in a kid's world. The real fun is outside of this cage. Can I watch my show tonight? Lily pleaded. Another kissy episode, Odin complained. Come on, Ponzi argued. She says she missed out the last time. I'd say Lily's show should be first. But we all had to miss out last night, Odin growled. It's no fair when some hog it for the whole night. Please, Lily begged. All right, Odin growled. But only if you give us time to look at pictures. We'll be leaving before you do that, Ponzi said in dismay. You guys really should stop looking at those. It didn't do me any good. What? You've spent too much time up in that mansion, France protested. If you don't like what we're doing, go back to them. I'm really glad that I spent time up there, Ponzi argued. It was good for me. There's a book I'd like to show you. Reading? I'm not doing any more school, Odin dismissed. Make up your mind, Ponzi. Either you're with us or you're with them. But it's changed my life, Ponzi pleaded. You see, the professor isn't the one who made us. There is a God who made the professor's world and everything in it. He, he wrote a book to tell us about him and how he wants us to live. There's a right way and there's a wrong way, and he's going to judge us for what we do. Shut up, Odin exclaimed. If you're going to keep talking like this, you're not on our side anymore. Do you hear me? Go back to your friends on the hill. But real friends do whatever they can to help, even if it hurts. Odin stopped and crossed his arms. I don't want to hear this stuff. Leave. Ponzi shrugged. I'm coming with you, he said. France spoke up. Then stop talking. On the other side of the glass, the professor shook his head in dismay. Ponzi is trying hard, he thought. I hope he doesn't get pulled back to his old ways. 
Watching his lanky, troubled son follow the stocky youth in front, the professor whispered, Franz, what are you up to? As the four tinies disappeared quietly into the hill, Jax murmured, Why do you and Odin keep making poor choices? You need help. How do I help you? Unable to hear the conversations inside the cave, the professor was too distraught to continue any profitable work. Mechanically, he began cleaning files on his hard drive, all the while keeping an eye on the control monitor to see what was being accessed on the phone in the cave. The first hour was fairly harmless. Lily is getting her way, he observed. He was intrigued that the Greenville University page held their attention next. And then a do-it-yourself site was investigated with details on how to make a flying fox. A rustling noise alerted him that some were leaving the cave. The rainmaker was passing overhead, programmed to come on when everyone was asleep. Perfect timing, Lily exclaimed to Ponzi, out in the open again. I'll stand in the rain and get all cleaned off. I don't want Amy to get even more suspicious. It's so dirty in that tunnel. As the two tinies laughed and washed off in the rain, the professor was dismayed to see the names of various internet sites now coming up rapidly on his screen. There were things he'd never thought to put on his blocker. In anguish, he realized, France and Odin are choosing corruption. How I wish I'd encouraged Louis to give them some guidance. How can their lives be simple and innocent after this? They may never erase these images from their minds. How is this going to affect the way they treat others in paradise? I fear for my girls, especially. Is my world still safe, or is everyone in danger? What can I do to combat this? With a sinking feeling inside, he realized he didn't have any easy answers. He didn't know how to counter the powerful allure of human depravity. He didn't know how to save his wayward tinies. Running to the bathroom, the professor was physically sick. When he returned, weak and shaken, he determined that he needed to set up an automatic shutdown of the internet from midnight to six in the morning. I will encourage Amy and Zahir to put a password on the phone, he thought, so that no one can access it without them. They may want to share it with everyone, but unsupervised access of evil will ruin paradise. Sighing deeply, he wondered how the two young men would react if he turned off the Wi-Fi. With the click of a button, he tested it out. A few minutes later, two tinies emerged on the far side of Rainbow Hill, and they were blazing with anger. But, but that's never happened before, Franz was arguing. With many interjections of foul language, Odin complained, Something's gone wrong. It better not happen again or I'll smash my way out of this place. We have oxygen tanks. We can leave any time we'd like. Astonished, the professor thought. What? Did they steal Louis' oxygen tanks? I'm coming with you, France boasted. Paradise is so boring and there's not nearly enough girls. Not when one guy takes three. Three? The professor wondered. Then he realized that Damien had stolen beneath his heart and was now flirting with Georgia and Dia. He had to admit it was a little unfair. It was then that the professor heard the young man come up with a plan that left him anxious and afraid. The professor put us in a cage, Odin scoffed, so we can do the same to someone else. Exactly. And her new den is perfect. No one knows about it but us, Franz agreed. Heading home to the forest, the schemers discussed how best to capture their prey. Jack swallowed hard. Paradise is no longer a safe place, he fretted, pacing outside the dome. What will I do? I can't allow these two to bring any more suffering on the others. The girls will be terribly distraught if one of their friends goes missing. He remembered the constraint triangle that Seth had showed him months ago. You can have two of the three, he recalled. A loving community, free will, or everyone lives. Well, I will certainly never put anyone to death, he told himself proudly. And then he remembered the threats. Damien might. There could be a terrible struggle. And what will I do with a murderer? Or, oh dear, what can I do? He asked himself desperately. An idea popped into his head. I could consign those two young men to the nursery and do some intensive counseling with them one-on-one. -on -one. That's it. That will help. I know it's helped many in my world, but how do I get them in there? Still feeling greatly distressed by what he had uncovered, he stroked his goatee. 
What if I hadn't overheard this plan and a third disaster had occurred tonight? He sighed deeply. If only I could reverse this miniaturization and take everyone out. Pulling out his phone, his hand trembled. Oh, la la, I need to call Evan, he said.